what we have to start at the very basics, what is resistance? So essentially, it, resistance is when infection no longer responds to an antibiotic treatment. That's the basic definition of what resistance is. You can also say when infectious agent, which we call a pathogen, no longer responds to antibiotic treatment. So you can talk about the infection, the person who's infected, the infection being resistance, or the agent, the bacteria usually being resistant. So if we look at resistance, so let's say you unfortunately cut your finger and you got this cute little cell in there, this bacteria, which is going to find itself in a nice warm environment with lots of food. Well, what's going to happen is that bacteria is going to start to grow and divide and make more and more and more bacteria. So at this point, your finger is going to start to uh, show signs of infection. Usually it's red, warm, etc. Your immune response has started reacting. And you might go to a doctor because, say, I got a problem with my finger. Well, the doctor then might give you an antibiotic, shown here. The antibiotic then, depending on what type of antibiotic, usually you take it orally, it will go through the bloodstream, it'll eventually get to your finger, and it will interact with the bacteria. And then one of two things happens. In this example, the bacteria are going to start to die. So they start to disappear. So the infection starts to go away. But there's this guy here. That one is still remaining. That one is an antibiotic-resistant bacteria. It essentially doesn't care. It sees the antibiotic. It's there but it doesn't interact with the cell in the same way. That cell then, now everybody else is dead, this cell can start to grow and divide. And you start to get more and more bacteria again. So that's one way in which resistance can arise. The cell either pre-existing or is um, evolved to resistance during an infection. So that's our first definition, what is resistance? Now I want to change a little bit and talk about how serious is this problem, because we see a lot of scary headlines about a lot of things. But I'm going to give you a few examples here, and I'll talk more next week. Here's a quote from the UK, from the chief medical officer, who said that modern medicine, as we know it, if we don't halt the rise of resistance, will be finished. And I'll go into more what she means here. And the WHO, uh, the World Health Organization, said, without urgent coordinated action, the world is headed for a post-antibiotic era in which common infections and minor injuries, which has been treatable for decades, once again can kill. So these are two very reliable sources that sound very scary. There was an estimate made a few years ago about the number of deaths due to antibiotic resistance we could expect in the future. And shown here is the number of deaths now due to antimicrobial resistance. I'll come back to that definition in a few minutes. About 700,000 is the estimate, but this is a low estimate because many parts of the world, we don't have good data about this. You can compare that to, for example, cancer, which is about 8 million, and then these other diseases here. They made a calculation that by the year 2050, if nothing is done, and that's a key phrase there, if nothing is done, they estimate that the number of deaths due to antimicrobial resistance will rise to 10 million per year. So this, again, is a very scary number. Uh, some, I'm going to give you a few other examples. In Southeast Asia, it's estimated that 98,000 newborns die each year due to bloodborne infections from resistant bacteria. 
In the EU, it's estimated that there are about 225,000 deaths per year due to antibacterial resistance at a cost of 1.5 billion euros. So it's an expensive problem as well. In Sweden, we are relatively well off as far as uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, we have good health care, et cetera. But even in Sweden, if you look at, uh, this is one type of resistance called ESBL, which you'll hear much more about soon. Uh, between 2000 and 2015, you can see that the numbers are rising rapidly. And this little star here means that in 2015, there were actually 43 cases in Sweden of so-called ESBL carba, which is resistant to yet another antibiotic that is a last resort antibiotic. So this looks very, these numbers are very low, but the pattern is scary. So what does it mean if we don't have antibiotics? I mean, uh, you can imagine you probably, your finger would probably be okay if you got an infection like that most of the time, et cetera. But a lot of modern medicine depends on the use of antibiotics. So if we start just with quote unquote regular infections, like urinary tract infections. This is uh, one of the primary reasons that people in Sweden would get an antibiotic. It's a huge, um, it's a very common infection. But then you have gonorrhea, pneumonia. Gonorrhea is already has a completely drug-resistant variant uh, in the world. Pneumonia, wound infection, blood infections. But then in more modern technology, you have things like treatment of preterm babies need a lot of technology that exposes them to a lot of infection and need antibiotics. Hip replacements, for example, Inf um, infections are common and antibiotics are used. Complicated deliveries of uh, babies, organ transplants, cancer treatment, etc. So a lot of different kinds of treatments uh, depend on the availability of antibiotics to be able to treat, to be able to, to be available. So now I have a little thought question for you. Now, let you take a minute to discuss with your neighbor. How did antibiotic resistance become such a problem? Based on what you know already, what do you think? So discuss for a minute, and I'll take a few suggestions, and I'll show you my list. There are a lot of opinions about this question. There's no right and wrong answer. I have my own personal list of the top reasons. First, and, and you'll hear much more about this throughout the course, overuse or misuse of antibiotics, absolutely, both in people and animals. Uh, and cleverness should be in quotes. I don't mean they're really clever, but I mean they have ways to evolve to become resistant. And that can happen very rapidly. And then the lack of antibiotic drug development. So for me, these are the three top reasons. And many of what you said fit into one of these three. So overuse also, um, underuse or misuse would also apply there, as well as um, dumping it into the environment is also a big problem. So you will hear much, much more about these and other points. The good news, though, now that I've depressed you on a Monday night, um, the good news is things are changing. Researchers worldwide are focusing more and more on this problem. The center I mentioned only was created uh, four years ago, but there are a lot of people working on this now here and other places. Efforts are being made to change policies, so decreasing the amount of dumping in the environment, for example, uh, and overuse of antibiotics in general. And then this course was created because we want to spread awareness. We want to let people know about this problem and give you ideas of what you can do or what you can support 
your politicians from doing. Another piece of good news is this. I showed this graph a few minutes ago, and it's ESBL in Sweden. Here, you, know, you can barely see this. I'll draw it for you. Since 2015, it's a straight line. In other words, this didn't keep going up, 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 as this implied. But actually, do, it, probably the reasons for this are very complex. But the rise of this superbug, as we call it, has actually leveled off in Sweden. And this is due to a lot of different uh, changes in treatment and policies. So things like this are getting better um, sometimes, but in some countries. All right, then before I pause, I want to uh, point out one thing that I mentioned, which is antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial resistance is a broader term. It includes bacteria, viruses, parasites, and fungi. So all small things, basically. This course is only about bacteria. It's antibiotic resistance. So it only is um, looking at resistance in bacteria like tuberculosis, MRSA, which you may have heard of, E. coli, gonorrhea, et cetera. It could be a whole nother course to talk about resistance to parasites and malaria and things like that. But I just want to make sure the two terms are clear. So in this uh, today and uh, next week, I'm going to talk about these things. I'm going to start with the basic questions. What are bacteria? What are antibiotics? How do antibiotics treat infections? How do we find new antibiotics? What is the resistance? How does resistance occur? And how is it spread? And this is all the questions you will get answers to in the next two weeks, tonight and next week. So I'm going to start with my first question. What are bacteria? So bacteria, as shown here, are very, very, very small. Uh, they, this is the uh, head of a pin, and this shows bacteria coated on the head of the pin at increasing magnification. So bacteria are microorganisms, meaning they're tiny, made up of usually single cells. So unlike people, people have lots and lots of cells in one organism. Bacteria usually only have one. Bacteria are extremely diverse. These are two examples. This shows uh, E. coli. This is uh, uh, Staph aureus, Staphylococcus aureus. It's not really purple. It's been colored in this picture. There's estimated to be between 40,000 and 1 billion different species of bacteria in the world. It's a huge range. And there's huge uncertainty about this number because there's probably on the order of thousands that have been studied, not billions. If we think about this number and look at an evolutionary tree, you can't see anything here, of course. It's uh, an evolutionary tree. These are all the different organisms or types of species in the world. If you zoom in, that little branch includes all animals, plants, worms, and the insects. Almost everything else, or everything else is microorganisms, and everything in blue is bacteria. So when we're talking about microorganisms and bacteria, we're talking about huge diversity. So it's very difficult for me to talk about any particular uh, bacteria or talk about bacteria in um, very concrete terms because there's a huge diversity. So you will hear me say in this course, most bacteria are like this and most are like that because I can't talk about all of them. There are always exceptions. So when you have this huge diversity, how do you even get started in characterizing? If you go to a hospital with an infection, how do they even get started? Well, the first thing we look at is cell shape. So, and this shows different shapes of bacteria. Okay, 
So what you have up in the top left corner here, these are called cocci. They're circles, they're spheres. Uh, for example, a Staphylococcus aureus is a spherical bacteria. So it's a circle, as I've drawn here. Then you can have something called diplococci, which are two of the cocci stuck together with each other. Then you have streptococci, which grow in long chains of spherical uh, bacteria. And then there's a few other variants here. And then below are the bacilli. Bacilli and cocci are the most common type of bacteria shape. And again, you have a bacillus, which is a rod shape. It's longer than it is wide. And then you have diplobacilli, which is two stuck together, or streptobacilli, which grow in chains. So these make up the vast majority of bacterial shapes. But then you got a lot of different odd things. For example, down here, an uh, example is Colobacter, has a, a stalk sticking out of it, a large appendage on the cell. You also have Vibrio, which are shaped like a comma. And you have, really can't say this, a corkscrew shape that is actually like that. This is the first way that we would, if I get an unknown bacteria, my first thing to do is to look at it. what is its shape. And that starts to let me uh, figure out what type of bacteria it is. Uh, I want to mention quickly, bacteria are not viruses. Viruses are different from bacteria. Viruses grow inside cells, and they aren't actually cells themselves. They don't have all the machinery to be able to produce new, reproduce new cells. Some viruses, and you'll hear this next week, actually infect bacteria. So just want to make clear, viruses, not bacteria. Uh, so in this wide diversity, I want to point out also that we most of the time think of bacteria as bad. All right, they cause disease, there's a problem. That is not really generally true. Most bacteria are perfectly fine. We need them. We need them to digest food. We need them to help plants grow, um, et cetera. We need bacteria all around us. And so we only usually talk about a handful of bacteria. In fact, there's only around 100 bacteria, types of bacteria, species, that cause disease as shown here. So about 1% at most can cause disease. Some examples that do cause disease are mycobacterium tuberculosis, listeria, and salmonella. So next, in the next section, I'm going to start to describe the shape, uh, or sorry, the structure of a bacteria. So now I want you to pause again for a minute and think about what do you think a bacteria needs to be able to grow and survive? What are the basic needs of a bacteria? Think about that for a minute. <laughs> 